Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Using Educational Technology in the English Language Classroom. My name is Lauren and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Amanda, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, our host Kate will be talking with our presenter, Vocal Hagelheimer, about tools and techniques for using educational technology. So let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome. We're so happy to see you all here today for our featured webinar. Let's begin today with these great comments from our wonderful participants during the final session of American English Live Series 7. Um, we encourage you to engage with your community virtually like we're engaging with you now and perhaps posting comments or photos of virtual uh, viewing parties or anything like that. Um, so you can see this one from Mariana. Thank you so much for sharing with us this very important information and it will be possible to apply in our daily life with our students. That was a wonderful comment. Thank you so much. Let's see. Uh, we have a couple from Maricela and Omar. Awesome tips. Thank you so much and excellent. Great ideas. What else do we have here? From M. Teresa, we have thank you so much. Very useful and motivating for all types of teachers. And from Faiza, informative, thumbs up, and coffee. We all love that coffee and those thumbs up. And one more uh, from Yashoda, fantastic. And Roger, thanks for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. So we love to see your comments um, and we hope that you will stay connected with us in with view, virtual viewing parties or maybe if you're having a WhatsApp discussion group about our webinar or that sort of thing. We'd, we'd love to see any comments that you'd like to share. Um, so if you do have any viewing group parties, uh, virtual or otherwise, please email photos of those to American English webinars at FHI360.org or share them on social media um, and use the tag American English for Educators. So here's what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and is often related to an American English e-teacher massive open online course or to a teacher's corner theme on the American English website. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments too. But as I've said, we really hope to hear from you, our audience, um, because we want to hear your ideas, experiences, thoughts, comments, etc. So please do share your thoughts using the comments or the chat box. When our session comes to a close today in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of this post, click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully done so, you can expect to get your badge by email from badger at badger.io in about a week. We'd also like to announce that American English Live Teacher Development Series 8 begins on May 6th. We will explore teaching reading in the EFL classroom, communicative language teaching, fun and varied approaches for common grammar topics, and pair work and group work to encourage student to student interaction. Be sure to register using the link on the screen and we look forward to learning with you again on May 6th. And finally, before we begin, we'd like to share information about our free massive open online course on the exact same topic as today's webinar. And we're very pleased to be able to host the actual creator of this course today as our presenter. At any rate, please enroll today for this free course and learn more about free technological tools how to use those tools in learning and teaching, and how to evaluate the appropriateness of each tool for your specific context. And here's what the enrollment page looks like once you click on that enrollment link, and we hope that you'll join us there. And now for today's session, using educational technology in the English language classroom. This webinar will address the effective use and integration of technology to teaching vocabulary, reading, grammar, writing, listening, and speaking skills. This session will provide an overview of the use of technology in the English language classroom, identify specific technologies suitable for the development of six target skills, and encourage the integration of freely available technologies in the classroom, and equip all of our wonderful participants with a toolkit for exploring technologies to help teach essential language skills. 
And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Volker Hagelheimer. Volker is a professor in the Department of English at Iowa State University with a master's degree in TESOL, a PhD in educational psychology, and nearly 30 years of teaching and training experience. He has presented in many parts of the world, including Austria, Canada, Finland, Germany, Taiwan, Turkey, and the US. His main research interest is computer-assisted language learning. Volker is a part of a team at Iowa State University that has been developing and delivering a global online course and a massive open online course called Using Educational Technology in the English Language Classroom through our office at the US Department of State to participants from all over the world since 2017. So welcome Volker, we're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. I um, wonderful. When I woke up about an hour and a half ago, I looked outside my window and um, to my surprise, there was snow. We had about a half an inch of snow this morning. So I got downstairs, made myself a cup of tea and I'm ready to uh, meet and talk to everybody online here about this. But before I get started, I'd like to mention that um, in order to develop a course like that, you know, you need to have a strong team. And um, I just wanted to share some of the, some of the faces and names of uh, the current team members, uh, which are instrumental in getting this course uh, going. The course itself, as you can see on the next slide, is, um, is a, a, a big course that is offered around the world. And um, we've been doing this course since about 2017. Um, and it exists in two versions. It exists as a global online course, but also as a massive online, uh, open online course uh, that is currently in session. And we have a little over 7,000 participants in that course. So we hope that you will join at the end of this, uh, this one hour webinar. Uh, we've learned a lot from the nearly 1,000 participants that took this course as a, as a global online course. And um, this experience really shaped the webinar. So the organization of the webinar um, is then uh, as follows. Um, I would like to start out by talking about educational technology. That's the title in the, of the webinar. I'd like to talk about what it is, what it means to you. And then I'd like to give you some tools for the classroom, um, activities that you can use immediately and right away with your students. But I'd also like to take you behind the scenes a little bit and um, look at some tools for teachers that maybe uh, require a little bit of extra work ahead of time before you can use it in the classroom. And then we'll finish with a recap at the, at the end. So I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad you're with me for the next about 50 minutes or 55 minutes or so. And um, I'd like to uh, start up by actually asking you to participate in the chat. On the next slide, you will see that what I'm asking you to do is, what is your definition of educational technology? Please share that in the chat and I'm gonna be reading it. And I'm gonna wait about, about 20 seconds uh, before I move on and I'll share with you what I think my definition is or what, what we'll use as a definition for educational technology for, uh, for this webinar. So let's see what, what ideas you have about educational technology. Wonderful, yeah. Let's hear from you, everybody. What is your definition of educational technology? We'd love to see your ideas in the chat box or the comments. So what do you think, everybody? Let's see. Technology which aids in the teaching process from Yusuf. Thank you, great response. What else? Karima says using internet and computers. Let's see. Using technology to teach from Miriam. Let's see, teaching using different platforms, great. Using technology to help in education. Um, the ability to use technology tools to teach from Maria. And let's see, what else we have? Using some apps, online resources to create engagement with the students, great response from Bitha. And let's one, one more, let's see, using resources of different kinds in class to engage students from Irum. So wonderful responses, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. So um, I'll sort of tell you what my definition is uh, for digital technology. That is digital educational technology. 
It is digital technology used to facilitate learning. The key aspect of these technologies is that they need to facilitate learning. And if I just may, may take you back to, you know, about 50 years ago in 1968, you know, that's when cassette players, and um, some of you may not even know, I've never experienced cassette players, but they were introduced in 1968. And then they found their way into the classroom and they were used for about 20 years before they were replaced with CDs um, and then they were replaced with DVDs. And then about 25 years ago, you know, 1993, 1994, is when the World Wide Web became popular and it has been uh, transforming in terms of what we can do. Uh, one additional component that I'd like to mention here is that about 15 years ago or so, we, we started getting some uh, digital portable music players. So we would listen to music and that just changed the whole game. We didn't have to carry these large uh, LPs or CDs around. We had everything in our palm of our hand. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what happened. Now, nowadays, the world is all about apps, about applications, and um, everybody seems to be using it. Uh, or web browsers, you know, so everything that you access, all the materials you access, you access through, through web browsers. And um, what I'd like to do here is, um, in this webinar, we'll actually focus on resources that you can access through a web browser. Many of you, all of you, clearly have access to web browsers, otherwise you would not be uh, in this webinar right now. Um, so um, I'm going to focus on resources on the World Wide Web uh, that we can all access through web browsers. So the focus is really uh, of, on, on web browsers and on resources that are available. So let me sort of ask you another question, though, before I go on and talk about my considerations. When you think about what is important or what are some considerations and guidelines prior to using web resources, prior to using apps, uh, what are some of your uh, considerations? Could you share with, uh, with us uh, in the chat? I would love to see that. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you again, everybody. What is important to consider when choosing your educational technology tools? So what sort of considerations or guidelines do you usually think about before you use a certain um, resource or a tool in your classroom? Let's see, what do you think? What are some um, ideas for guidelines and considerations? So it has to be user-friendly from Constantina, great. Learning objectives is the most important thing from Beatrice. Great. Easy to use or access from CIED. I opt for free, user-friendly, easy to use tools from Amina. Great response. Does it serve the purpose of the class from CNEM? Very good. Yeah, you always wanna be thinking about that objective. And easy to use and accessible from Astari. And Sharon also says accessible and practical. So great responses, everybody. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you very much. These are, these are wonderful responses and they align very much with the way I, I look at te educational technology. So if you look in the, on the next slide, you can see sort of a, an overview of, of aspects that I think are very important when it comes to educational technology. And let me talk, just talk you through uh, some of these here um, one by one. And this aligns very well with everything that you've been saying. Uh, the most important thing is really, is it available? Does it even exist? You know, is it, is it available in my context, in my, in my city, in my country? Uh, that's very important. Then I talk about accessibility. The question is, can I access the resource? Can my students access the resource? But it's also access in terms of, um, are they gonna be able to understand the resource? So that's another level of accessibility. Affordability for me is key. It's very important. Now, how much does it cost? Can I afford to use this, this resource? You know, that's, that's really important. And then, as mentioned, many of you mentioned, suitability. Is it suitable to my learners, for my students? Uh, another consideration that I always weigh in when I make a decision about what to use is authenticity. How authentic is the resource? Is the content created specifically for learners, or is it authentic content created for for also for native speakers. Uh, another key question here is accuracy. How accurate is information? Can I trust the information that I'm using? Uh, those are all very, very important uh, considerations. And then there's clearly engagement. 
how engaged will my learners, my students be when they interact with the resource? That's, that's, that's an important question. How is it presented? Is it something that is sort of on one the boring side that people will not uh, look at? Or is it something that's exciting that has um, interaction, interactivity built into it? Uh, so I can tell you from my own experience as a father of four kids, it's a lot easier to tell them, let's watch a video than it is to say, hey guys, let's read a book. Uh, so we wanna have something that engages them, that is good for them. Uh, so that route is what I would uh, advocate for. And then the biggest question I always ask is, what does it add? We do not want to use technology simply for the sake of technology. We wanna say, what does it add? What does it do that traditional tools uh, may not have? So think about, think about that with every resource that you use in your classroom. So, and I'm gonna start by, by showing you one of my favorite resources and uh, that happens on the next slide and that is Voice of America for vocabulary and grammar. Now, many of you have saw, probably seen Voice of America, have, have looked at that web resource. I think it's absolutely uh, phenomenal. And um, I'd like to sort of talk to you about first, how we can use this with regard to, to, to vocabulary. So, um, vocabulary here, um, I love this quote by David Wilkins. It says, without grammar, little can be conveyed. Without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. If you don't know the word or the words, there's very little you can say. You can use your, you can use your expressions, you can use your nonverbal skills, but other than that, it's very, very difficult. So, you know, if, if I say, you know, I've been learning a little bit of Turkish, if I say, Ekmek, people will know I would like some bread. Um, so vocabulary is just, it's just very, very important. Now, the, that brings me to my next slide here, which indicates that really vocabulary is a key dimension of uh, language learning. Okay, so why do we teach? Why do we learn vocabulary? Um, it's just the key dimension. This is something that we need. And when we talk about vocabulary learning, there's uh, people often talk about two different types. There's the incidental kind, and then there's the intentional kind. Um, so incidental means, you know, it's just something that you happen to pick up as you're learning the language and you're reading something. It's like, oh, this is a new word and uh, you happen to pick it up. Intentional happens when students are studying specifically vocabulary. And I think there's uh, quite a few of, uh, um, well, there's certainly one wrong assumption to assume that uh, students will simply learn the vocabulary by learning the language. I think it's more, it has to be more intentional. And what I'd like to share with you is uh, how technology can help with that. Um, and I'm gonna take you through an example of um, a wonderful section within the uh, VOA Learn uh, net network or the, the website here. So on the next slide, you'll see, this is something that you may have, may have seen or you probably have seen. Oh, I, before we get there, yes. Can you share with me if you have looked at the Voice of America News website? Can you share that in the chat? Is this something that you've seen? Yes, I have. I, it says here from Fabiani. Uh, no, no. Oh, well, there's quite a few no's and yeses. Um, yeah, it looks like we have um, sort of maybe a few people who have um, used it before and others who haven't. So that's great. We'll be able to share some great resources from that website today um, that you may be able to use in your classroom, uh, whether it's virtual or in-person classroom today. So it looks like we have a lot of people saying yes and no. Alba never heard about it. Sahir, Sahar, yes. Subuhi, yes, etc. So great. That's wonderful. So I think one thing that you could put on your list for, for, for later on today is to go visit that site, you know, check it out and see what's going on. So I'd like to share with you sort of one section first, and that is called news words. Uh, what it does, you know, it shows you a word that can be used in, in, in the classroom that can be taught, and it brings with it a video. It's a one minute video, and we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Uh, but, but first, I want to sort of go back to the considerations that I have about this. So it is accurate, it is current, it is authentic, and it is of global interest. It covers 
news from all around the world, and it focuses specifically on on news items. Here in this example, it's the word endurance, but we'll, we'll do a different one in just a second here. Um, this uh, Learning English website, which is part of VOA, really was launched as a special English back in 1959. And that's, you can see some of that on the next slide. Um, the, um, but then in 2014 is when this new line of products occurred or was added to the website. And um, I just use it whenever I can. You know, I try to build uh, lesson plans around it. And um, I'm gonna take you through uh, one idea here uh, in just a second. So if you go to this website and if you scroll down, you will see this is the, you'll see the first page um, where it says, ask a teacher, and there's about variant two, variant two. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, you will actually see a segment that I, I like a lot, and it's, it's called upcycle. So it's something about, about upcycling, okay? Um, so what we'll do here is we'll take you, um, I'll select this for the, web, for the webinar here. Um, and the, the word that we're gonna cover here is called upcycle. So in the next slide, you'll see a screen and then you'll watch a brief segment, uh, uh, one minute of uh, what the videos are like. So we'll go to the next screen, we'll watch that video, and then I'll come back and I'll talk to you about how we can use this in the classroom. Okay, wonderful. So today we're gonna to be sharing a video and we're hoping it works out really well. Usually we don't share videos, so we're trying something new today. Um, so if you don't see the video, um, please just bear with us for a couple minutes, but I think we'll be able to hopefully see it and it should be over in about a minute in case you are not able to see it. Welcome to the Voice of America's Newswords. In Yemen, an artist uses an unusual product to create pieces of art. Upcycle. Artist Sofian Noman combines his art skills and concern for the environment to upcycle old tires into colorful household art. I started reshaping the tires given the current situation created by the war. I also do it to protect the environment. To upcycle is to turn waste materials or unwanted products into new materials or products of better quality and environmental value. It is similar in meaning to recycle and reuse. Thank you. Wonderful. So hopefully you were all able to see that video and um, yeah, we'll go ahead and continue. Okay. Thank you very much. So now on the next slide, you know, my, my big question is how do we use this in the classroom? And there's some ideas that I have and there's a three-step process that I usually follow that, that seems to work. So uh, this could be a unit around conservation and waste reduction principles. So we could talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, or upcycle, you know, that would, that would be another option. Uh, I think the unit would work well in an online setting. You know, now that we're not meeting in school, uh, people could find materials in their homes that they may upcycle, you know, something that they could use. They could des describe a process, they could post and share a picture. Um, so the next, uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll outline a sort of a three-step process. Um, I think step one is students need to understand the difference between recycling and upcycling. And I have a slide on that in a minute here. And then in the next step, it always helps me certainly to have some inspiration. Um, so um, I go to Pixabay that has uh, free, free, free images that you can use. There's no royalty charge. It's, it's freely licensed for, for everybody. And then step three is really, you know, let learners be creative. Watch them be creative. They are wonderful and creative people. So on the next slide, you'll see sort of a, a beginning of a handout that I created here where we, we, we can juxtapose, we can put side to side, you know, what does it mean to recycle, you know, breaking down materials. And students, no doubt, uh, will have seen ways in which materials get recycled. They may collect uh, paper, they may collect 
metal, they may collect uh, glass bottles and jars, and then they, they turn them into the local resource recovery plant. Or they could upcycle something. They could, uh, something that is uh, no longer of use. Uh, the example we saw in the video is old tires. And um, so this is something that, that would, be, would be really easy to do. Um, they can tie into recycling efforts that are done in the classroom, their home, their country, and so on. So the second step then is to give them some, um, some inspiration, give them some examples. And as you can see here, we have, you know, materials that have been upcycled. So there's a skateboard that turned into a guitar, um, wine corks that turned into a pen, a pen holder, uh, plastic bottles that are used for decoration in a tree, uh, glass bottles that can be used as candle holders, and then uh, bottles, glass bottles that can be used as a uh, that can be used as a lamp. So, the next step is let students be creative. Let them let them come up with some ideas. But before I share with you what I think they could do, I'd like to hear from you, and I'll give you you know about twenty seconds or so. Um, maybe what do you think your learners could report on? Uh, what would be a report? What would the report look like, and how could they share it with their class? All right, so let's hear from you, everybody. So we saw the video and we saw some ideas for how to use that in the classroom. Um, how, what do you think? What kind of things would your students be able to report on? Um, and how would that look in the classroom? What do you think, everybody? How could they share it? We're gonna be showing an example in just a moment of a student written report. Um, but what do you think? What kind of topics do you think would be good? So yeah, um, they could, let's see, Muafi says the process of upcycling. So that's great. Um, Yevgenia says present, presentation or a poster. Maybe, Rama says maybe the per, students could create an audio file. Great. Um, definitely. Richard also says they could use posters. Great. Maybe they could talk about uh, recycling policies in our country. That's really interesting from Virginia. Um, great response. Excellent. Excellent responses. Excellent responses. So what I did, I looked around my, uh, my house and I'll share an example here with you. Uh, so this is a sample report that students could write. I mean, uh, that covers what object did you pick? How was it used previously? You know, how long has it been broken or not used? And what did you make or create with it? And how difficult was it to upcycle the object? So I have about, uh, I don't know, many, many soccer balls in the house that are, that are broken and that are no longer used. Uh, they clearly were used for, 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 for playing soccer, for playing football. Um, and then the example that I have here is, it was like, could we turn a, fo a football uh, into a flower pot? You know, could we, could we put flowers into it? So this is just an idea of what um, we might be able to, we might be able to, to, to do here. Okay, so this is just an idea. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas in the chat and um, we'll move on and talk about using the same tool, but for grammar. And uh, what we'll do here is, um, again, we first ask the question, why learn grammar? Um, and, you know, clearly now that we, we've covered vocabulary first, learning grammar is important because we need to combine words into larger and meaningful chunks and units. Uh, we need to communicate more complex ideas. And um, what I'd like to uh, sort of um, advocate for is a, a more expanded view of grammar. Uh, grammar is often viewed as maybe not the most exciting uh, topic to cover, but if you go on to the next slide, uh, you will see that this uh, learning English has on the next page actually has a, um, a grammar TV, everyday grammar TV, it's a beautiful uh, little grammar section that covers different grammar topics. And um, the one that I selected for this webinar is um, on, on the next slide here is something about, you know, um, no, you know, can be used as a, as an acknowledgement marker. It can simply be used as a filler. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but, but first, um, have you heard of people use, you know, especially when they speak, you know, is it usually at the beginning, the middle or the end of the sentence? 
And if, however it's used, does it make a difference in its function? Um, I'd look, I'd love to see some ideas that you have in the, um, in the chat. Yeah, if we can just take a look at the next slide here. Um, have you ever had uh, heard somebody say that kind of phrase, like, you know? Um, and when do they usually use it? We'll, we'll go ahead and continue on, but we'd love to see your responses to this question in the chat. I, I love it, I love it, excellent. So, you know, can be used as an acknowledgement marker to make sure that the listener, so this is on the next slide now, um, you know, as an acknowledgement marker uh, to make sure that the listener understands or agrees with what the speaker is saying. Um, it can also be to soften the strength of a statement. If I say, you know, the bus leaves in 50 minutes, you know, is, you know, it, it softens it a little bit. I could just say the bus leaves in 15 minutes and then like, whoa, what, what did I do? But you can <laughs> soften it by saying, you know, you know, you know, the bus leaves in 50 minutes. And by that, I'm assuming that my my, the person that I'm talking to uh, knows that. You can also use, you know, as a gap filler. Well, you know, I'm not sure. If you're looking and searching for the right words, uh, you could talk about that. So I think what we're gonna do is we'll go to the next slide, but we won't watch the video uh, this time around. I'll just show you what the video screen looks like. Um, and um, you can watch it uh, after, after the webinar is over. And I think I'd like to focus actually on the next slide to show you an activity that I would use or I would create with, with students about this. So again, you could have students create sentences. You know, the bus leaves in 10 minutes, or I'm going to order a pizza. Uh, I enjoy watching movies. Um, they don't have to go yet. These are some statements that students can create. And um, now the activity could be, how could we add markers such as you know uh, to those to those um, to those sentences so in this case I picked you know but there are obviously other acknowledgement markers that you could include here um, but you can see here as an example you know you know the bus leaves in 10 minutes it, it, it makes a difference in terms of how it sounds and in terms of how it feels in terms of the uh, the directness of uh, what is being said and this is all part of part of grammar really Okay, so this, this goes in there. Um, I'd love to hear from you at some point um, later on how you might use this, but before we get to your input again, I'd like to start about, uh, give you a, a student activity on the next slide where um, wouldn't it be nice to, uh, to, think, to get students to think about um, acknowledgement markers and gap fillers in English, but also in their native language. What do they use as part of um, acknowledging the common understanding with the speaker in, in that. And then we, we, we're getting um, wonderful comments here already in the, in the box, which is great. So you can invite students to explore uh, other acknowledgement markers or gap fillers, such as, well, mm, uh, um, okay, and like, you know, those are all kinds of, uh, so we have, we have some here say, um, Balkla, Benar, and so on. So uh, actually, I have a little activity for you in the next slide where you can, um, what acknowledgement markers and gap fillers do you have in your native language? You know, again, you can put those in the, in the chat box and Wait. you know, you could say, you could indicate the, um, the language and then the acknowledgement marker or the gap filler. So the example that I have on this on the screen here is in English we use you know, okay. So let's see what else we have. Um, we yeah, have. wonderful. And so um, one thing that's really great about um, the Voice of America uh, website and ways that you can use technology for this is you can introduce that type of everyday grammar with video, and then you can have students share their ideas as well. And we saw a lot of great ideas um, from participants when we were asking about um, uh, other tools that you use. But yeah, you could share, have students share recording audio files, maybe through WhatsApp, um, or there are a lot of other apps like Flipgrid and that sort of thing that you can use and share, um, and students can share, um, or you can even just have video chats where people share. Um, so it looks great. Thank you for sharing all of your 
um, ideas here in the chat about the gap fillers that you use in your languages. Um, and feel free to share in your, in your language or what the translation would be as well um, in English. So great, I think we're gonna be able now to go ahead and move on to some exciting collaborative writing assignments that we can have our students do with technological tools. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So yes, this is, um, I'd like to talk to you, talk you through a, uh, what, I, what we call the collaborative writing assignment. And this is really the biggest project of the course that uh, we're teaching this using educational technology in the English language classroom um, it's the most popular uh, assignment, um, but it's also a difficult assignment in, in the sense that, you know, it takes, it takes collaboration. Um, and if you have worked with others, um, you probably know that it's not always easy to collaborate. You know, people have different, different styles. Um, they approach things very differently. Uh, so group work and collaboration work can be challenging. Yet, that's what's happening across the world. It's all group work. Um, so let's start out by thinking about um, why we want to teach writing. Um, yes, so uh, again, writing is an essential skill to learn in the English language. Um, there are different phases and steps of writing. And you can apply and consolidate vocabulary and grammar rules. So the aspects that we talked about before, we could now integrate words like upcycle, or we could, uh, you know, grammar points that we could integrate into our writing here. Um, what I'd like to talk briefly before I, I get deeper into the, the writing tool itself, I'd like to briefly talk to you about um, writing and technology. What's that connection? And what we have uh, since the inception of word processing, you know, we, we now have moved on from writing with pen and paper to pretty much most of us write by typing. So that, that gives us certain affordances. We're able to copy, paste, revise, edit, all these things that are now second nature to what we're doing that we're not able to do before. Um, at the same time, in previous times, you know, you would type on a computer, on your own document. Um, now we have the option of collaborating with others through a cloud-based collaboration tool, such as you know, Google Docs or Microsoft Teams to blogs, Weebly, and tools like that. So that's really, really wonderful. So I'll take you into this uh, assignment that, we, that we're using in, in, in class, and um, you'll be able to look at this. There's a little bit more text involved here um, as I go over the next five or six slides. But I, I hope you, you'll bear with me here uh, because I think it's a really, uh, a pretty phenomenal um, assignment. Uh, Great. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing how we can um, really focus these online collaboration tools um, in our classrooms. And just so everybody knows, this recording will remain on our Facebook page and we will also post it on the AmericanEnglish.state.gov website. Excellent, thank you, Kate. So the prompt that we give our students who, who sign up for these classes as a group, they will collab collaboratively write a letter to the, uh, the sponsor, okay? And um, the letter should be about 200 to 350 words. So what we do is we assign the group members different roles. You know, there's the role of an initiator, a topic facilitator, a content facilitator, an outlining facilitator, and then they all will engage in reviewing and editing. So what I'll do is I'll talk you through these different roles in a little bit more detail here. And I'll, I'll, I'll just hit the highlights on the next slide. Um, and then um, you'll be able to go back to this. Um, but clearly the most important role initially is somebody needs to create and name and share the document on a cloud-based service. And what happens or has happened in the past is you know, we have to make sure that uh, all group members have access to that document and that all group members have edit capabilities. You know, how often has it happened when, you know, you, you're invited to share a document and then you can't edit, you can't, you can't contribute. Uh, so these are all important roles that we need to do here. Um, this initial initiator also initiates collaborative work by asking all group members to define the purpose of the letter. What should it be? 
So to be gratitude, greater, uh, make a request and things, things like that. Um, so these are just some highlights here and we'll go on and talk about the next one here. The topic facilitator is somebody who needs to, anytime you have a, a large group, even a, even a small group, you need to um, come to a consensus about the purpose of writing. Um, and you need to ensure that brainstorming can start. You know, once we know what we're going to do as a group, that's when we can, we can start brainstorming here. So this person would encourage topic suggestions from all group members and keep track of those suggestions. Okay, and this person, like every other role, what's very important is you, you continue to ask for feedback throughout and you keep the group motivated. Motivation is just a key aspect here. Um, which is also the same for the content facilitator, somebody who encourages content contributions from all group members. Um, so that's the content facilities on the next slide here, uh, where I highlighted all. And this is really important. You know, if you've worked with a group, you know that maybe not everybody contributes the same way, or maybe not everybody contributes. Uh, so if you have somebody who checks on who does the work, um, you know, I think, I think that's really important. So they keep track of the suggestions, they provide constructive comments and so on. And then uh, we get to the next, uh, the next role here is that, that of the outlining facilitator. Now that's really somebody who outlines the document, the format of the document, you know, what's the heading, what's the address, how do we, uh, what salutation are we gonna use? What's the body looking like, the closing, the signature? And then this person works with uh, other members uh, uh, regarding that. And also this person drafts one part of the letter. So it's the initial writer of one part of the letter. And again, it's important to tell the other group members that, hey, I'm gonna be the one writing this part as a draft. And then we need to make sure that all the other parts have folks or group members that are responsible for those specific parts. So that's what the outlining facilitator does. And then we have the, uh, the last one here is reviewing and editing. Now, obviously everybody has to be involved in um, reviewing and editing suggestions with all group members. You have to keep track of this, um, of these suggestions and then What's very important in this last step is also to compare the work that they are doing, um, the work that they're doing and uh, what I was gonna say is um, to keep track of their suggestions, okay? And to look at the grading criteria. So um, I have an, a sample assignment that you could use here on the next slide. And that is a virtual field trip. So now that we're all social distancing, we may, we may not be able to, to see each other, you know, as a group, they could write a letter to the teacher suggesting a virtual senior trip or a trip that, that concludes high school uh, to an arts institute, to a museum, a science center, and, or anything else nearby, the nearby, nearby or anywhere in the world. Letter could be about 300, it should be five to 500 words, not, not zero, zero. So we do not want them to write 300,000 words. Um, but it would be 300 to 500 words and they would include a, a relevant and appropriately referenced images. And again, um, the example I have here on the slide is, um, you know, I have the Chicago Art Institute and I have the Louvre. Uh, both of them are closed right now, but their websites are open. So they can still look at what it would take, what would be interesting about uh, visiting those, those websites until they can actually go there in person. And then the roles you can assign are, as I indicated before, initiator, topic facilitator, content facilitator, outlining facilitator, and then somebody, and then all of us will have to do reviewing and editing. So this is just some, some examples here. Uh, yes, you can have a virtual field trip with, with your students. I think this is a, a good idea. Thanks for mentioning that in the chat. So we're gonna move on and talk about listening and speaking online tools. I, I wanna make sure I get to those we have about 13 minutes left and I think we can cover most of it. Um, so 
let's go on to the next slide. And listening, I don't know how you feel about listening, but for me, I, I taught listening for many, many years. It's a fun class. I love listening because we get listened to so many different things. Uh, it's essential for speaking. You can improve other skills. And it's, it's a way to gain access to information in the world today. Um, one area that I find extremely useful is podcasts. So I listen to quite a few podcasts that are interesting. I also listen to audiobooks. You know, so there's a lot of listening you can do. Um, and I'd like to share with you, um, while you're thinking about this on the next slide, like I'd love to hear what your favorite audio and video sources are. What do you consider before using these sources in your classroom? So maybe you could spend, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 seconds um, talking about this or putting this in the chat box. And then um, I'll move on with, uh, with one tool that, that I think is, is very useful. Great. So we have people saying podcasts, YouTube. Um, what else? What other tools do you like to use with, for audio and video sources? And what are some of the considerations that you might think about? One consideration I like to think about is to make sure that I view the video or listen to the audio before my students do to make sure it's perfect and appropriate for the student's level and for what they're interested in. Um, TED Talks, great. Let's see. Um, making sure that it's useful for the students, relevant to the objectives that you're teaching, wonderful. Lyrics from songs from Rocio, according to the level. It should be age appropriate and should be audible from Cedra. Um, Marcella says that most of her students find listening very hard as well. I think that's something that a lot of people feel. Listening is really fun, but it also can be a, a hard skill to develop. BBC and VOA learning apps from May, that's great. And um, Anna says that she likes to think about the theme that she's teaching and her students. So wonderful responses, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, these are, these are great responses. This is exactly, exactly what I would, I would say as well. Uh, very, very good. So what I have here is another resource that was not initially mentioned in, in your uh, post, but I think <clears throat> the American English website has some outstanding materials <coughs> excuse me, available. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, websites. And uh, if you scroll down on the next slide, you will see that there's a, a, a wide variety of listening um, options or listening tools. Now, thankfully, um, I don't have to talk much about this because what you can do, uh, if you go to the next page here, uh, next slide, you can see that uh, actually a webinar was created by Jennifer Hodgson about uh, about this exact uh, topic. So um, uh, I have a screenshot so that you remember what it looks like and you can take a look at the um, at this year on the next slide here is uh, listen up using audiobooks for English teaching. It's an entire webinar that is wonderful for you to look at and watch um, before uh, you know you, you jump into it and you use it in your classroom. Now on the next slide you know that we talked about aspects of to consider, and you mentioned many of these in your in the chat here. You know, we need to look at the quality and the appropriateness of the of what we're listening to, the duration, whether or not it captures student interests, uh, whether or not, especially if we use videos, are there some cues that help us predict the topic or the content? And once you've selected a tool that you want to use, um, then you know it, it. It's your turn to prepare activities you know you prepare for example incomplete outlines so that students can complete an outline uh, while listening to to these tools or you could do a, a fill in the blank uh, questionnaire that you put in and what's beautiful about all this is you can extend the classroom i think of this as being able to extend learning from the classroom to outside the classroom so what i have here uh, prepared for you next is uh, a set of three slides that talk you through a sample listening plan. And as you see here is uh, uh, we selected um, a, a song on YouTube, uh, another resource that you mentioned quite a bit, uh, where we prepared a pre-listening activity where they listen to this song. It's about daily routines, about what you, what you do. So the target audience here really is 
um, uh, the target audience really is younger, younger learners. Okay, so uh, we have pre-listening. Um, then you could go on to the next one where it says then while listening, what could they be doing while they're listening to the to the audio? And then there's an activity that we uh, that we where we created um, afterwards. You know, so what would they do after listening? So this whole notion of what do you do before you listen? What do you do while you listen? And what do you do after you've listened? Um, and this requires work on the, on the side of the teacher. But I do think that, you know, you can, you can do this and you can use the resources, but they require some preparation. So let's, uh, let's go on to the next, um, Next slide here. Based on your teaching experience, what advice would you give others who are trying to use audio video resources? Now, I think you've already mentioned that. This is already something that you've covered. Um, and we can go on to the next tool that talks about speaking. And that's just a brief one, but I'll take you through um, that as well. You know, again, I'm trying to keep the time in mind here. So um, speaking um, on the next slide, yes, is the basis of oral language production. It is essential for travel. Now, I've heard people say, you know, it's kind of embarrassing uh, when you say, oh, I've learned this language, but, but I can't really speak it. Um, uh, you know, that sometimes, it may feel like a failure. It may not be one, but um, we really want to make sure that people can speak uh, appropriately. Now, the connection that I see between speaking and technology is, and I'll show you something else later on uh, for the teacher tools, but it's really, um, the one resource that I think is really useful is the Voice of America. They have a pronunciation tool and that allows you to select names and places that are more difficult to pronounce and they give you, they give you that pronunciation. Um, you know, so we have challenging names and places of the, in the news and um, you can you can go there, you can look at, look at those words and you can understand and hear the pronunciation. And oftentimes it is not only the word itself, but it's also in, in the context. So let's, uh, you know, you can maybe, let's go to the next slide here and you can in the chat while I continue, I think you can talk about your favorite speaking resources. Yes, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. So we're going to continue. We know we got started a few minutes late today um, because of our technological challenges. So we'll probably go over a few minutes. So um, you are, we will share the digital badge link with you very shortly here. Um, and we understand if you need to get going, but we'll probably go over a few more minutes. So we hope that you can stay and continue learning about all of these wonderful um, tools. But as Boker continues, please share some of your favorite speaking resources uh, related to educational technology. And thanks for sharing all of those. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Yes, yes, yes. So we'll go on to the um, tools for teachers. So we've, we've talked about tools for the classroom. Now we're talking about tools for teachers. And one of the tools is, uh, the readabil is a readability tool. So I'll talk about two, readability and Youglish, um, time permitting here. So the readability tool is really uh, what I'd like to take you through here on those next few slides is the, under, the, the notion that sometimes it's difficult to select the reading passage that fits for your students. You, you don't quite know, you know, yes, you can look at suitability in terms of the level and uh, in terms of the interest, but oftentimes it's more difficult to assess how difficult, how easy a reading passage is unless you put it to the test. Okay, so what we have, what I have prepared here for you is, um, it's called a free website called the WebFX Readability Test Tool. And I'll take you through this, um, this set of slides. Again, what I did here is I wanted to show you that American English has um, wonderful reading materials. And if you go on the next page, the next slide here, um, we'll, look, we'll take a look at one specific one. Those are graded readers and they come with activities. But let's pretend uh, you're looking for a different um, text and you want to find out how suitable it is for the students in your class. So what you do is you select the reading text. In this case, I went to um, American Teens Talk. I selected 
um, Bianca, I think here, it was Bianca that I selected here. And I wanted to point out sort of one caveat. Um, when these readability tool uh, kits require you to paste text into them so that they can analyze the difficulty and the readability of that, of that tool. So on the next slide, um, what I have prepared here is instead of selecting and co copying and pasting on the website itself, it sometimes does not work. So instead of cutting and pasting from there, what I do is, and that's illustrated on the next slide, I actually download the PDF and then do the copy and paste. And in this case, on the next slide, I'm pasting it into my readability test tool and hit calculate, the calculate button. And what it does for you is it takes that text and it gives you some readability indices um, as outlined on the next slide. Um, and I think the one that's uh, you, you may have heard of is called the uh, grade level indicators. So it tells you what grade this is approximately uh, targeting. So in this case, we have, if I had my glasses on, I could see this better, but I think it's 8.8. .8, so it's about ninth, ninth grade. So that would be the level of reading that it can do. Uh, what's beautiful about this tool is it provides um, explanations, as you can see on the right side, of what these results mean. So they give you that. They also give you, on the next slide, um, statistics about the text that you submitted in the, the number of words, the number of paragraphs, the number of odd words, you know, the number of uh, complex words. So there's a lot of information there that I think would be too much for learners, but I think is wonderful for teachers. So I hope you'll get a chance to, to try that out. And that brings me sort of, not, not sort of, this brings me to my last uh, topic, uh, and that is Youglish. Um, it's a tool that I absolutely love. Um, and the importance of learning and teaching speaking is really, is really, is really key here. Uh, we need to be able to talk to get things done. We need to be able to maintain relationships. An issue that is often uh, happening here is uh, we have problems with pronunciation, sometimes with fluency and accuracy. What this tool allows you to do is it's basically a collection of YouTube videos that is annotated and you can find instances of how words and phrases are being used in real life, in authentic situations. So what I did uh, in preparation for this webinar, I selected some just to show you um, how you know is used in, in, spoken, in spoken English. Okay, so if you go on to the next slide, uh, you will see, um, you know, that it, it really shows natural speech from fluent speakers, and it uses, you know, over 10 million YouTube videos. If you look on the top right, you will see that it's almost a million. It's about 870,000 hits when I searched for, you know, and then if we scroll through the next three slides here, it shows you, you know, different examples of how it is used in, let's say, in TED Talks, in the news, uh, or in other documentaries. I would like to point your attention to this slide right here, where Euclish also provides you with an option to um, select words you don't know and to find out more about, about these words. And then, the last slide before we move on to the, the end here is uh, that Youglish also has a lesson of the day. So if you sign up, you can get uh, regular emails of randomly selected videos. You can adjust the duration and repetition times of the utterance, and you can have it, you know, you can have it happen every four seconds, every, every six seconds. So you can adjust, you can adjust that. And then you can also adjust how often you receive these uh, videos or these emails. All right. So this brings me to my second to last slide where, you know, we're going to do a quick recap uh, of what we've covered today. 
And uh, so we talked a little bit about education technology, what it is. I shared with you some tools for the classroom um, and tools for the teachers. That was a little rushed, but I hope you go back and, and take a look at the, the video and uh, later on. And then we, we did this, this recap. So I'll leave you with this last question here is, you know, if you want, you could add to the, to the chat, which of the following or which of the technology toolkits or tools will you add to your toolkit? Yes, we would love to hear from you from all of these wonderful resources and tools that um, Volker shared with us today. Which of these do you think you'll start to add to your toolkit? Maybe one of the lesson plan ideas or one of the websites that was shared. Um, what do you think, everybody? We'd love to hear from you. Let's see, Aziza says Youglish and VOA, wonderful. Um, Youglish, oh wow, lots of great answers here. Um, and some extra ideas as well for, for other things that teachers can use, great. Uh, the readability test, a lot of people are mentioning that they would like to use. Uh, Uzair says Youglish will be helpful. Let's see. And a lot of people, as usual, giving us nice comments about thank you, thank you, et cetera. So we have lots of people saying that as well. Um, so thank you guys so much for those re wonderful responses. So we, we do have references for you, of course. And um, then I'd like to thank you. I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate. Uh, and I'll bow out uh, of, the, of the current presentation. Well, thank you, Volker. We don't want you to bow out too much because we want to make sure you see all of the comments and, and um, excitement and enthusiasm for all, from all of our wonderful participants. Um, thank you, Volker, so much for that wonderful presentation on using educational technology in our classrooms. I know that a lot of people are, are using new tools right now, so we're so happy that we were able to learn from you um, about ways that we can incorporate more uh, tools and to um, focus our assignments even better for our virtual and in-person classrooms. So thank you so much.